Welcome everyone to today's Digital Technologies webinar. Uh, today at the ACA we're going to be covering the topic of cybersecurity and where that fits in in the curriculum. Um, and it's great to have a few people joining us live. There'll be opportunities to engage with us throughout and I'll um, give you the rundown on to how that will take place when we get to it. But thanks for joining us. And um, as I said today, um, we're covering the school cybersecurity challenges and how we can use these to address the cybersecurity aspects of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. And I'm Bruce Feuder. I'm going to be sort of leading the webinar today. My role at the Australian Computing Academy is as a computing education specialist. And I was one of the writers and advisors of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. Uh, and prior to starting my work at the ACA, I was an associate principal in a school after having taught digital technologies for about 15 years. Joining me as a co-host today is so it's just Professor James Curran. I'll let James introduce himself. So uh, I'm the Academic Director of the Australian Computing Academy and I'm Bruce's boss. So my main role here is to ensure that he's not being too sassy, especially about education systems outside of the educational nirvana that is the ACT. Um, uh, I'm also uh, an academic in computer science at the University of Sydney, been teaching computer science um, at Sydney Uni and running outreach there for many years now. And I was also one of the authors of the Australian Curriculum Digital Technologies. All right, thanks James. So um, look at any time during the, uh, the webinar, if you've got any questions, feel free to throw them into the Zoom chat. Um, there'll be opportunities and we'll do our best to make sure that we address those as we get through the content. So one of the things that we will make sure we send out to everyone who's participated in the webinar or who hasn't been able to join us and will be catching up later is um, a link to a Grok learning workshop where we've um, essentially pre-enrolled or give you pre-enrolled access to the cybersecurity challenges. That link, that link is on the screen now. It's just comp.ac slash cyber dash roadshow. But we'll be sending out uh, that link to everyone who registered on the event bright site anyway. And if you're catching us on YouTube, I host this webinar, um, you can use that link. But if it's not working, because it will stop working at some point in the future, um, you'll be able to still access all of the cybersecurity challenges directly through the Grok Learning Platform, which we'll talk through at other state at other times during the um during the during the webinar. So uh, we've introduced ourselves, the ACA, the School Cybersecurity Challenges, is a project that we've um, that I'm the current lead for, and that we put in place with the support of the Big Four Banks and BT. And through that arrangement, they've provided the funding and a lot of the uh, professional knowledge and expertise that we needed to ensure that the activities that we were developing for students around Australia were, um, I guess, were relevant and appropriate for the current security environment and that's one of the things that we've really been sort of angling for with the resources we produce at the ACA is to make sure that they're not just curriculum linked but also that they are they are relevant to modern uh, modern computing and and practices in in both the workforce and in in computing more generally yeah and um our other partner in the project was OSCyber which is a government owned organization uh, that's deliberately trying to build up the cybersecurity industry and education around Australia. So we've got a good mix of government and industry involved in the development of these challenges. And, um, you know, both industry and government really see this as an area of high demand, both right now and future demand for, uh, for our kids to be future cybersecurity professionals. So, as far as cybersecurity and its role in the curriculum is concerned, it does fit in two areas. Uh, there is the digital technology subject itself, and you'll see the references to cybersecurity in the subject through language such as how data is secured, through the management of access to data, issues like data privacy are called out um, ex explicitly. But in addition to that, the ICT general capability covers the application of social and ethical protocols and practices. And a significant a part of that is understanding how to, I guess, take appropriate action online to ensure the security of your information and the privacy of your information. So uh, you can see full curriculum mappings for all of the activities in the lesson plans. 
uh, that we've that we've published alongside each of the challenges and they're all available on the ACA website the resources section we're linking to that later on as well so that you can see exactly how that all works but um, it's important to point out that we've tried to make sure that we're addressing both the, um, the general capability and the digital technology specific content throughout the, um, the challenge offerings that we've, we've developed. So as far as what the challenges involve, there are, they cover both the technical and non-technical aspects of cybersecurity. That means that they focus on both the skills that are involved, um, but also the general problem solving and dispositions that people need to develop to be able to um, participate in cybersecurity careers and opportunities. And the other thing that we've done with, the, um, with, with a lot of really good input from our partners is emphasize the career opportunities available to people who are passionate and excited and very good at these skills because we wanted to highlight to students that there is a lot of breadth um, of opportunity in this area uh, for people who both are technically inclined but also those that are, just have a general interest or enthusiasm for, for everything about cybersecurity. The challenges are funded through the partnership for all students in Year 7 to 12 in Australia but um, right now as a result of the, the COVID-19 situation till the end of Term 2 um, it's all, they're also accessible to students in year five and six. So we are in the process of developing a version of the challenges that is more suitable to year five and six students. But in the interim period, if you're a primary school teacher and you're looking at ways to engage them, um, then this is one opportunity that's available to you. So uh, don't feel like you can't get involved if you are a, um, a primary school teacher. There's definitely scope to, um, to get involved with that right now. Uh, the other thing that's a feature of them is the automated marking and feedback that's provided by the Grok Learning Platform. Um, we deliver through Grok Learning Platform because it does allow us to provide targeted feedback and automated marking to students so that they can be confident of their progress through the activities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the specific aspects of, of Grok Learning that feed into the challenges as we demonstrate those capabilities. Now the first challenge that we're going to look at explores information privacy and security and our approach to this was to consider how we could put students in the shoes of someone who is essentially looking for vulnerabilities in systems. So we were conscious that we didn't want to create uh, an environment where we were weaponizing students to use these skills for evil. Instead, what we've done is um, developed a sort of social media environment that students participate in where they're filling the role of what is effectively a white hat security advisor type person at their school and they're receiving messages and information from um, friends and other other peers in in the school to solve and deal with issues that are the pretty benign but that through the activities that students do reveal the kinds of risks and associated um, I guess vulnerabilities of information that they need to be aware of to be able to, to participate safely and in a secure environment uh, while they're working online. So as a result this particular challenge complements existing cyber safety resources really well. We didn't want to I guess overlap with what is generally covered in cyber safety so we don't cover things like for example um, uh, cyber bullying and grooming and those types of risks instead we've left that to the activities that have come out from the you know, e-safety commissioner and other projects and instead we focus largely on the information security and privacy issues so it's a nice complement to the other stuff that a lot of schools are already doing and in terms of our um, in terms of our philosophical approach here, our goal is not to be finger wagging at kids. In general, we find that that doesn't work, and that's the feedback we get from teachers as well. So, our goal is to present to students a realistic scenario of how um, how their information that they share online can be exploited and used to guess passwords and security questions and other things like that. But then ensure that that is actually coupled with an ethical framework that allows kids to explore those ideas, but understand that you know, once, they, once they have the ability and understand how these things work, that they need to use those skills in an ethical way. And so 
we wanted to make sure because it covers such sort of general good practice skills, we wanted to make sure that as many students as possible could access them. So we decided this particular challenge wouldn't have any sort of technical expectations. So there's no programming required to participate in this one. Um, and because of its broad applicability for schools where there may not be a very well developed digital technologies program, it's really ideal for dropping into existing pastoral care classes um, as well as IT classes. So because of that, we wanted to keep it relatively short and most students we find can get through this in about four to six hours. So it's not a huge impost. And we've also found that for a lot of teachers, uh, for a lot of students, sorry, um, once they get started on this, there's enough engagement and enthusiasm for them to continue working on it outside of school time. So they may not even need that, that full six hours in scheduled class time. You may be able to get away with just one or maybe even two hours in the, the school pastoral care program and then encourage students to go off and finish this outside of, um, of regular or scheduled class time. So it does work really well for all students in year seven to 12, um, which means that you can sort of look at injecting it into your pastoral care program at whatever year level is going to fit most appropriately for your existing program. So what we thought we'd do is show you how you can cover these ideas in a non-technical way uh, so that you can, I guess, mix up the way that you might introduce these ideas to students. And one way that you can do that is through this responsible sharing activity that we've developed. So, um, so that you can participate in this, what we're going to ask you to do is use the Zoom annotation feature to get involved with this. So uh, annotations you'll see at the top of your screen in the view options drop down. You click there and then click the annotate option. And what that will do is it should reveal a second annotation um, toolbar, which looks something like this. And what we're going to do is ask you to use the stamps throughout. So we don't mind what stamp you choose. Feel free to drop a stamp on the current slide to make sure it's all working. Um, but yeah, okay, that's looking great. We're seeing stamps appear everywhere. That's excellent. Um, what we're effectively going to be asking you to do is to provide a response to the, um, to the questions just by clicking on that stamp button um, when the time comes. So uh, let's start. The way this activity works is we're going to put in the centre, so what currently is empty, the blue card in the middle, um, a piece of information. And what we want you to do is put your stamp in either the OK to share or the don't share card, depending on whether or not you think that is information that is OK to, to share online. So when we do this, this activity in the classroom, we have a, a deck of cards that you can distribute to students. Um, they can be shuffled up and they can literally just sort of lay them out to demonstrate whether they think something is okay or not okay to share. And then um, when you flip the card over, it's got the correct answer on the back. So you can use this as sort of a way of introducing a lot of these ideas to students and to generate a lot of the discussion that we want to facilitate and encourage. And um, I know- Kenny's, Kenny's actually showing a, a deck of cards right now. Um, if you can um, see Kenny there, I'm not sure we can actually show him. But the other thing is, by the way, is you can find that deck of cards on the ACA website as a PDF you can download. Also, if you visit us at any events that we run, we've usually got some decks of cards that we're handing out um, to teachers and we're just looking at the process of putting them online uh, as well so that you can buy them from Amazon so we can send out decks of cards to you at a much cheaper cost for us to um, produce those cards on mass and then for you to buy them rather than print laminate, cut up and laminate and you know all of that kind of teacher time that that involves. If I unmute for a second, you might be able to, to see what you're yeah. yeah. So they've got thanks, Kenny. Excellent, thanks, Kenny. So let's uh, let's get started with our first uh, piece, of, piece of information. The first piece of information that we're going to ask you to your your advice on or your thoughts on is your name. So if you think it's okay to share your name online, put your stamp on the left hand side in the okay to share box. If you don't think so, then you've got don't share there on the right hand side. So we're seeing lots of little ticks and arrows and stars coming up on the okay to share card, which is looking good. Uh, I'll give people another few seconds to put their response down. All right, we've got a couple of random ones in the middle. 
one over there on the right. So let's reveal the answer per our cards. And our position on this is that it's okay to share your name online. And that's because your name on its own is largely not enough to identify you uniquely. Um, and so whilst there are, you know, there may be some particular exceptions to a lot of these rules, as a general rule, sharing your name online is something that is not going to lead to any major leak of private information. Yeah, and before we go on, um, Sajatha has just shared the links on the uh, resources page um, for where you can get those PDFs and we'll be putting up all of the links in the, uh, the chat as we go along. Okay, so next up, the town or city. What do you think, is that okay or is that something you should not share? Okay, I'm starting to see. A lot of ticks on the left, a few more in the middle. Yep. So that's a bit of time for people to respond. Let's take a look. Again, like, like your name, your town or city alone is generally not going to be a lot of information that people can use to um, identify you exclusively. Uh, look, the smaller the town, uh, then maybe that's going to start to be changed in terms of, of a, you know, whether or not that's something that is going to allow someone to find you. But you know, in larger cities or, or larger towns, that's generally relatively safe uh, in terms of sharing online. What about your PIN? Uh, something you should share or something you shouldn't share? All right, nice. Oh, that was swift. <laughs> up on the right-hand side. Um, and I think it's pretty safe to say that, yeah, this is there's definitely a bit of information that you shouldn't be sharing online. Obviously, once someone has access to your PIN and your bank account, you risk losing all of your money. So definitely not something to share. What about your home address? Is that okay or is that something you shouldn't share? All right, again, a stack of quick responses. We're jumping up on the don't share side. And sure enough, we agree. Um, your home address is not something you should share online um, for a number of reasons. And most people instantly think of this in terms of you know having uh, people you don't know accessing your home in case of burglary and things like that. But it's worth pointing out that your home address is often enough information for places like call centers and things like that um, to prove your identity. So if someone can call up a call center and then they ask, you know, what address are you registered with us with? Um, your home address is often enough to get through that first, that first sort of identity check. Yeah, and it's worth pointing out, this is not just what we think in the ACA, but also the considered opinion of cybersecurity professionals across five very large organizations um, that deal with cybersecurity threats and responding to problems that customers have had with cybersecurity uh, as well. So you can be, you be, can, can be confident in our uh, choices and also our explanations on the back of the cards for kids too. So email address, what do you think? Is that okay or is that not okay? Oh, this is a bit trickier. People are, some people have gone for the, I don't know, in the middle of nowhere here. No, we've got a couple yep. of no's. Most people are saying yes. Okay. Um, one of the things that I didn't do, because I'm a little bit cruel and I do this to students as well, is I didn't tell you there's a third option. Now, some of you were using the third option anyway <laughs> and putting it in the middle and not committing. Um, but it's good when you do it with students initially to force them to commit one way or the other. And that way they have to provide some kind of justification. But the reason the email address gets a share with caution is because, um, First of all, it is a pretty unique identifier. The thing is, you often do need to share your email address with a lot of places for the purposes of communication and creating accounts and things like that. So what's really, really important here is that you make sure that the way that you're sharing your email address is appropriate. Um, and that's part of the discussion that we want students to, to really understand is that over time, you know, the more services you use online, the more things you engage with, you're going to have to provide information for different purposes. As long as you know how that information is being used and what that information is, then it's generally okay to be sharing information that can be a little bit more identifiable or sensitive. So in addition to the offline activities, we've got a whole stack of online things. And what I thought we'd do is actually give you a look at the platform and how it works. Um, so I'm going to jump into this link and hopefully um, you'll be able to see this share in just a moment. I do have to switch it over to this window. So 
I believe you should now have in front of you um, an example of our interface that we use for our social media information security challenge. So what's going on here is this is your phone. Your phone has on it um, an application that we've called the Help Desk Q&A app. And this is the application where your students at your school, your friends and other students can send you questions um, that you will then use um, to, to, you will then go looking for the information to show or to answer the question so that they can help the, these students out. So here you're getting messages from Christy. Christy said that she's got Fabian's maths book. Um, the test is tomorrow. She's concerned that he's not gonna be able to do his studying but she doesn't know where he lives. So she asks whether or not you can do anything to help her. And you say, hey, maybe I can um, find it online, any social media. So this is a relatively early question in the, um, in the challenge. You click back to the home screen of your um, phone and we've built a couple of apps. So we've got Fistbump and Fistbump, you can see looks a little bit like Facebook. You've got people sharing statuses and photos and people commenting on those images and liking them or giving fist bumps. Um, and all of these individual students that we've got here um, have had entire profiles developed for them. And then we hired actors to go out and grab appropriate photos and um, essentially build these characters' personalities. Yeah, so we've got a fake phone. We've got a fake... Um, Facebook and you'll see in a minute our fake Instagram as well and then we've hired a bunch of actors um, to pretend to be friends with each other as computer scientists we thought that might be a challenge but it literally took them a few seconds to be best of friends um, while we were still staring at each other's shoelaces um, uh, so essentially we've built this fake social media world that students very quickly um, become uh, completely immersed in. So one of the things that we weren't sure about when we developed this project was would kids find this a you know compelling environment to be in? Would they find it convincing? So the fact that it wasn't real quotes in face, um, uh, Facebook and Instagram, would that be a problem? And in our experience, the kids really get stuck in very quickly um, and start referring to the characters by name and saying, oh, Fabian's done it again. Or, you know, the things we'd really like to hear is them just getting those connections back to the real world immediately. So saying things like, oh, my mum did that yesterday um, is a very common thing to hear when we've, we've been running trials of these activities in classrooms. And so in this particular question, what you find is in a conversation with Harry, where Fabian's got his new drone, he's posted that online, um, Harry gets excited and through that discussion, he's inadvertently gone and shared his address. So um, when you put the address in and hit the mark button, what happens is that information gets sent off to the server, it checks. Um, you can see here I've actually made a mistake because I've entered the data incorrectly. And what it said is that it's checked the street number, that's okay, it's checked the street name, but the suburb doesn't seem to be right. So what I'm going to do is fix this up. I'm going to fix that up and put Mossman in because you can see there that he says it's still in Mossman. And this time with all of the information correct, um, I get feedback indicating that, yep, I have, um, I've managed to solve that problem. So uh, the idea here is that students should be able to solve every single one of these problems. Um, the, if they get it wrong, the hints provide them with a little bit of a bump in the right direction. Uh, and the, some of the more difficult questions actually have a hint available before you even get started so that you know where to start. Um, the questions do get quite tough towards the end, but the idea of the, this design was that we wanted to expose the information in ways that um, were typical of what you would see in social media, but also in such a way that every single student could get through the vast majority of activities so that everyone can complete it and, and learn the thing that we wanted to teach. So, I'm going to jump back to the slides now um, because where is it? There it is here. Okay. And what we're going to look at is some of the other aspects that we want to cover in this challenge. So I talked a little bit about building up the social media environment. 
Um, in addition to sort of understanding the risks associated with information, we wanted students to also understand the importance of passwords and good password practices. So here's a question for you. Um, on the screen, I've got a list of different security password or security policies that are typical when it comes to passwords and password creation. What I want you to do is I want you to use the stamp tool, which we've already used previously, to indicate which of these things you think is a good security policy. Something that you should use um, if you're actually going to be building your own password. So you turn on the annotation tool and you can label as many of these as you like. Anything that you think is a good password policy, just throw one of your, your little stamps in there. All right. I see no one is uh, keen on reusing passwords on multiple sites that our, uh, our partners in the project would be very heartened to see that that stays blank. But some of the other ones are a bit more interesting. Yeah. Secret questions on accounts, password managers. Hmm. All right. So let's have a look at um, this slide. And this, this might come as a bit of a surprise to some of you. So here is... Here is the answer according to, um, well, <coughs> different discussions that occur in the security industry. Now, note that what we're saying here is not that these things are necessarily bad in and of themselves, but what's interesting is we look at how each of these policies can actually lead to changes in individual behavior. So if you consider the forcing of that having upper, lower numbers and symbols in passwords, what that actually often leads to is poor passwords because people can't remember them. People are not- Or, or really people writing them down is the other great danger, of course, is that they end up either creating a file somewhere sitting on their device or uh, a piece of paper sitting somewhere around with those passwords on because they can't remember them when there's such a mixture of characters and symbols. And then that's the big thing. If the harder we make passwords to remember, the more likely people will choose bad ones. Similarly, when, as soon as we set minimum standards, that establishes what becomes you know, the standard. And most people will actually just go with eight characters if that's the case, if they can get away with it. Um, password reuse, it was really heartening to see such a zero response against that because once, you know, compromise once, compromise everywhere, that's a real risk when it comes to password reuse. Um, and when we talk at secret questions, one of the things that um, tends to occur is most sites actually give you a list of questions to answer. So it means that people generally become aware of the types of things that get asked on secret questions. So things like my first pet, what school I went to, <coughs> what was made in name, they're all very common. And so it's information that is easily targeted by people with phishing attacks and you actually see a lot of these kinds of things happen on social media. So if you've ever asked, um, wanted to find out what your Harry Potter name is by, you know, putting together your, the month you were born and the year that you were born with the day you were born and things like that, what you're inadvertently doing there is actually revealing information about yourself, such as um, you know, your birthday in that case. But you know, often you can find out your monster name by concatenating you know, this, the city you grew up in with the, um, your first pet's name or stuff like that. And, and what you're doing is giving away information that's often used in secret questions. Yeah. So, and for that matter, this often happens even before you're aware of social media. So if you're a parent and you took a photo um, of your child on their first day of school and that um, first day of school photo um, happens to have either a school crest on the uniform or there's uh, something identifiable of the school in the in the background of that photo you've actually given away one of the most common security questions what was your first school to um, uh, to everyone um, in your um, social media circle and often that circle is far larger and more public than people estimate and what you've actually done is given away information about your child long before they actually have the ability to monitor or control um, what's shared about them online too. So one of the things about these challenges that we're really encouraging is for kids not only to think about their own behavior but to think about the behavior of the people around them that could potentially um, make some of their data available.
And so really the big things that you want to be doing is um, using a password manager because you can generate passwords and easily use them um, that are unique everywhere and that are very hard to break. Um, and of course, two-factor authentication is really sort of the gold standard right now because it means that even if your password is compromised, that additional layer of security means it's unlikely that someone is going to be able to access your information. And that's why really, you know, banking services or newer banking services in particular are insisting on that. Um, and many, many services are now sort of saying, hey, we've got two-factor authentication available, um, consider using it to protect your information. So um, that, those are sort of the types of things that we want students to learn through their participation in the challenges itself. Um, and what I'm going to do is just show you some of the slides and questions that exist in the platform to cover this stuff. Um, again, they use, the, um, they use the, the phone interface, but we often produce or provide some sort of notes that sort of talk about some of these issues. So this is an example of, you know, you've done everything right. You don't share your information inadvertently, but um, we know that big organizations such as Facebook, for example, um, have had their data stolen. And if your information is in that data leak, then that's often made available generally online and you're in a situation now where through no fault of your own, even if you've got a really difficult password in place, um, it's now attached to your email address and so there's a risk associated with that. So um, here we have a sort of section in the challenge where you suggest to your friends that if they think they're secure, if they're concerned about their security, you'll investigate um, their, their, their sites, uh, their, their applications for them. And if you manage to get in, you won't do anything malicious, you'll just change their profile picture to a cat so they know that their, um, their account is, is susceptible. And so in this particular situation, what we find is Erin in a chat has sort of said, hey, um, you'll find that I'm not using Erin Chili on my, so I use that on my socials, but on email I use Spicy Erin um, instead. Knowing that, what we can do is actually access one of these sort of leaked password files. We can search through that file to find an email address with Spicy Erin in it. And on that basis, there's a pretty good chance that um, Spicy Erin is going to be Erin. And then we can try using her social login and the fully clock whatever the rest of that password is. I've cut it off here on the phone. Um, we can put that in and sure enough, we find out that that is her email address and that password is the one that she was using on, on Fistbump. So, and by the way, that was another example of that ethical framework again, that um, rather than just uh, attacking all of their uh, friends' accounts bef before actually asking for permission, the first step of the process was to gain consent before um, trying to uh, access or compromise someone's accounts as a white hat service. So that's the information security challenge, um, very accessible. And I guess one of the other things we wanna do with the time we've got today is talk about the breadth of security uh, issues that we cover in the, in the challenges. So the next one, one of the other challenges we do is web application security. And this covers the question of what web apps actually are and why security is important for web applications. So uh, given that the internet really now is a platform for so many things in our lives. We wanted to make sure that students understood that a web application is not just a website. Um, many of the, the apps that you use on your phone are actually talking to web servers and that information is also generally accessible through things like a browser. And so security in web applications has a number of uh, different angles that you need to consider but we focused on two for the purposes of this particular challenge, authentication, how an app knows who you are, and authorization, um, what you can do once an application knows who you are. So to do that, what we needed to do was um, actually build a simulated browser and web applications because it turns out that security restrictions on school networks often mean that students can't investigate web applications using developer tools which are built into the browser and so as a result we wanted this to to reflect the types of activities that security experts are doing in industry and when we talk to to our partners and the technical teams about this challenge 
the first thing they said to us was, well, we can do quite a lot in the developer tools in the browser. And just being aware of the types of things that you can manipulate or view and investigate in the browser is the type of thing we'd really like to see um, the general population being more, more aware of and more capable of. So that was our goal. Um, and as a result, this, um, this, this particular challenge is also quite accessible. It can be taught alongside any HTML and CSS activities you can do. It's a little bit longer than the previous one, takes about eight hours. And whilst we've written it for the year seven and eight age group, it's usable right through to year 12. And it wouldn't take a whole lot of changes to be able to sort of discuss or talk about a lot of the um, bigger issues and go a little bit further from a security perspective um, to make this a little bit more kind of um, appropriate for, for your older year groups as well, particularly if they haven't had this exposure um, previously in school, which is often the case for students in year 11 and 12 at the moment or in year 19 as well. So to introduce the ideas behind this, you could do this in a classroom activity separate to the challenge. There are a couple of different activities we've included in our lesson plan for this challenge. The first is a little bit of a look at authorization. So we can think of authorization in a physical environment much the same way as we do with an online environment. In a school, if you're in a situation where you were trying to determine who should access what, the first thing that you do is you consider the different types of users or, or people in your school. And then you'd start thinking about how the different areas of that school would be accessed. And so um, what we've got in the example is a number of different locations around the school. and We've got these different groups and we ask students to think about whether or not individual groups of people should have access to these areas and what that might mean in terms of where doors are placed and what doors need locks and those kinds of access levels, which is very similar to the approach we take with different sections or capabilities in web applications. The other thing that we want students to think about is the impact of their actions on others. Again, coming back to that ethical framework that we really want to encourage. So one of the ways we do this is we ask students to think about how some of these actions that they take might have an impact on themselves or for others. And we've developed this two axis scale for them to think about. So you can see if something is good for you and good for others, then it's a win-win. Um, but something that might be um, good for you and bad for others is quite selfish. So that might not be an appropriate thing to do. So what I'm gonna get you to do is with the annotation tool, I'm gonna to say, um, let's consider number uh, action D there. You use another person's session token um, on a website to get early access to ticket sales for your favorite band. Um, where would you place that particular action on this scale? Um, using another person's session token to get early access to ticket sales for your favorite band. Okay, so people are putting it there in the selfish quadrant. Maybe not as far down the selfish quadrant as you might put other things. That's that's interesting. Um, but you know that's and that's an opportunity to then talk about well you know sometimes uh, all of us but kids especially don't necessarily think about what groups might be negatively affected by something. So you might initially go well you know I was going to get the tickets anyway. In which case you don't think it's that bad for other people. On the other hand, if everyone did that with this session token, then there would be no tickets available through the regular sales. So there's an opportunity again to keep expanding on or getting kids to think more about the complexities of each of these different scenarios. Yeah, and I guess the other side of that too is what we haven't talked about is whether that's a single use token. I mean, if you use that and it means your friends can no longer get a ticket, um, then that might change the, the way you think about that completely. Uh, if it's just, a, if, if, if it was unlimited tickets available, then you know, is that much different to him sharing you sharing that token with you or buying that ticket on your behalf? And so they're the types of things that we intentionally make these quite grey questions. Um, they're the types of things we want students to be thinking about when they're taking actions in a security context. So there are a few different things we can look at in the platform from this perspective. I'm gonna start with something really basic and that is how data is shared inside URLs. And so one of the things that students don't often realize is that there is information in a URL that goes beyond 
just the address of the website that you're visiting. So um, these query parameters that are very common actually tell us, for example, what is currently in the person's car. And it says he used the form to buy the black sunglasses, then changed the URL to buy some red sunglasses. When we buy these sunglasses, what we see is we go to this purchase page and it tells us that all of this information about what's been bought is up here in the URL. Now, if I mark this right now, because I've just bought the black sunglasses, what will hey is it says, you've bought black sunglasses using the form, now change the item to read red sunglasses, because it's not quite right yet. We haven't actually done what the question's required. But if we change this URL, you can even do something like change the price and then resubmit this page. What happens is it actually goes through the same process, the same purchase process, updates the content on the page. And now if we were to mark this question and see the result, um, it says, have I made a typo? Maybe I wasn't meant to change the price. Oh, I need to submit that. Yeah, there we go. And you can see now that because what we're trying to do here is manipulate different bits of the data for our own personal gain, we often ask questions here to say, yes, you've managed to, to solve the problem, you've managed to find that vulnerability, but is it something you really should have done? Um, we want students to start to think about the implications of those types. Of <coughs> and, and one of the things that's a bit different between Cyber One and uh, Cyber Four, this challenge, is in this one we kind of tend to lead kids down a particular path a bit where they incrementally change things and they go from the line of just random experimentation to actually starting to manipulate the data in ways that is uh, not ex acceptable but we usually let them do it and then afterwards the next question is well was that the right thing to do so we've gone from a purely a uh, preemptive approach to a now an approach where we get kids to reflect on the choices that they that they made afterwards. Yeah, so one of the other things that we then can do is we can look at um, how data is moved around and how you can actually manipulate the way that data is used. So um, I'm just gonna make sure that you've got the right share up here. Yep, um, this here is our app called Snapchat. Now on Snapchat, people post their food that they've been eating and in much the same way that you might in something like Instagram. Um, but here, uh, what we found is that there is information in the page source itself that tells us extra information that's not visible on the page. So we don't know exactly where this photo has been taken, but if we look at inside the HTML, the HTML reveals that the location of this particular image is Sesame Street. So what we can do is we can paste this location in here and it tells us that we've, yes, we've successfully managed to investigate the page source and reveal information that way. And often um, the page source can contain data that is not intended to be visible for the user, but can in conjunction with other information you collect around the site be enough to start sort of finding vulnerabilities inside a website. So, um, we needed a way to make sure that students could see the HTML source for all of the pages we built. We needed a way for them to be able to sort of investigate a number of the other authentication elements. And so if we jump in here um, and look at cookies, it turns out that when we try to log into this website, we get access to a whole heap of additional information. So We've got this logged in cookie here that by default is off, it's false. If we change that and reload the page, all of a sudden we now have access to extra gigs. Um, and what that also means is we can, we can now access any <coughs> pre-sale events that are only possible to people who, um, who, who are already registered on the site or are members of the site. So um, what we've done now is we've actually gone in and bypass what is effectively a little bit of a kind of um, authentication member check on this website because I haven't implemented their cookie policy particularly well. So there are a number of slides prior to this that explain exactly how cookies work and what they're for and all those kinds of things. But um, our goal here was always to just make sure that these kinds of 
ideas and concepts were reflected as closely as possible to the real world um, in a way that students could actually engage with in, in a meaningful context. So I'm going to jump back to the main slide there. And while Bruce is doing that, let me remind you, if you've got any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat window. You can either message us privately or you can just send it to the whole channel and me, Bruce, or someone else from the ACA gang will um, happily answer those questions. Now, the last two challenges that I'm going to cover are a little bit more technical. Um, and so what I'm going to do is give you some overviews, a quick look at the different features that are built into these challenges. Um, but like I said at the start, we've got that short link that we're going to email out to all participants and you can use that to investigate them um, at your own pace and to dive into them and see how we cover a lot of these concepts. So we have a cryptography challenge that covers data encryption. It does that through um, the exploration of classic cryptographic ciphers and it talks a little bit about how the principles behind these classic ciphers are still used today. Um, we figured and we spoke a lot to our security advisors from the partners. We talked a little bit about how inaccessible a lot of the sort of modern cryptographic techniques are. And one of the things that really sort of stood out in that conversation was that it's less about students knowing, for example, you know, the details of modern encryption algorithms. What's more important is that they understand that you know, secure encryption is necessary because it's the only way we can guarantee that data is actually secure during transmission and storage. So that's been the focus here. Um, it focuses on data representation as a result because it's the data representation aspect of the um, Australian curriculum digital technologies where a lot of these discussions take place in digital technologies. And to make this uh, challenge as accessible as possible, we've included both programming and non-programming activities. Um, so you can drop it into your IT classes and it'll vary between six to eight hours depending on how much prior programming experience they've had and how much of the programming activities you actually do. Um, it's been written for year seven and eight, but encryption is actually something that is in current school curricula right up to year 11 and 12. So I'm sure you'll be able to find a place to drop it into your existing program. Now, here's a very simple classroom activity that's a great way to introduce this idea. Um, what does this say? You can either respond in the chat or you can use the annotation tools to um, you know, put your answer up on the screen. But I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to see if you can work out what maybe some of this message is, even if you can't get all of it. All right, so Will reckons the first words, hello. Quick on the buzzer there, Will, good work. Yeah. Uh, okay, and Brent reckons Australia for the second word. Well, yep. and um, there it is. Someone was uh, trying very hard to write those letters out. <laughs> so yeah, sure enough. Um, what we've done is we've actually looked for a representation of each of the letters that's a number. And the way that we've managed to do it in this particular example was just to use alphabetical order and the position of each letter in the alphabet. So just getting students to think about the different ways that we might represent text is, is important because ultimately when it comes to encoding and then encryption data, um, because computers are basically just very, very good at processing numbers, we need some way that we can store that information in a format that can be manipulated by a computer. So I'm going to step through some screenshots of the platform at this particular junction, um, but all of these are examples that come straight out of the challenge. The first is one of the ways that we make this concept of shifting um, ciphers around is through a JavaScript applet that is present in the challenge. So um, you can see here you type in a message and you can use the, the button to manipulate the key and you'll actually see in real time the alphabet rotate so that you can see how the encryption um, process works. So you can change the message and manipulate it and play around with the concept um, without having to do any programming. There are a number of videos throughout all four challenges that talk about a lot of the ideas and are presented by technical people at the partners. And what they do is they actually interleave a lot of the concepts with the work that they do um, at the organization. And they explain how in this particular case, Jesse talks about how 
patterns in text uh, reveal information about that text that allow them to break um, the, the ciphers by, for example, looking for the most common letter and understanding that the most common letter in English is E and there's a good chance therefore that if it's just a direct substitution, the most common letter is likely to actually be the letter E. Um, so yeah, we make sure that they, the students understand that the techniques they're doing are techniques that are applicable to what's happening in the, in the real world as well. <coughs> and we've had a wide range of industry partners uh, or their staff participate in the program. And our goal here really is for every uh, child, no matter what their context is uh, and their background, to be able to find someone whose story resonates with them. We've got people talking about very technical roles. We've got people talking about, um, you know, social engineering, um, social networking research. So if, if kids are really enjoying and are good at Cyber One, that for them to see that there are actually jobs doing ex exactly those kind of things um, in many large organizations around Australia and the world. So problems that use, again, applets and tools that we've built. So here they can actually start to perform substitutions and see the result of that substitution on the text that they've entered. If you wanted to mix it up um, and have students sort of develop their own ciphers and substitution, um, uh, substitution schemes, then um, you know they can use these applets to do those conversions for themselves. Um, you can see that the problems all have hints to walk students through it so that they don't get stuck. Um, but like all of the other features of the platform, um, you know, there's automated feedback and marking. So every time a student makes an attempt, they'll get feedback that'll push them in the right direction. And for those of you that are familiar with Grok Learning, you'd know that there are programming problems and a lot of those features exist in those as well. But for those of you who are not familiar, this is an example of a problem where after a number of examples are presented in the previous slides and you know, previous questions that build up to this, here we've got students actually performing an X or encryption on a secret message. Um, and we give them some examples that they can test their code on um, and they can see whether or not what's actually occurring is, is what what should be occurring in their code. So um, it builds up to this gradually. It covers a lot of the programming concepts expected for the year seven and eight digital technology subjects. Um, it's all been designed to address as much of the curriculum as is practical for a cybersecurity topic. Now the fourth challenge and the final one we're looking at tonight is the one on network security. Um, it focuses on how we structure data for transmission. It talks a little bit about routing protocols and how they work in networks. And as a result of covering that and focusing on the wireless transmission medium, one of the things we want to emphasize to students are the risks associated with attacks like a man in the middle attack um, and encryption, encryption techniques like public key encryption and the importance of those. And because working on network hardware is something that's near impossible to do in a school, um, what we decided to do was to use the, the radio module on the microbit, the BBC microbit, which is a nice, cheap, accessible device um, to actually simulate what is effectively a broadcast network. So this fits really nicely into IT classes. It's written for the year nine and 10 networking aspects of the curriculum, um, but there's really nothing stopping you from using it again with seniors, students, or if you was a way that you were looking to extend students in year seven and eight who, and who are doing a networking unit, who have a little bit more of that technical capability under the hood, um, it could work really well for them as well. Especially for schools where you're already using a BBC microbit, so you've already got the hardware in place and you just need some activities to really extend those strong kids. So there is an offline activity you can do called Tablets of Stone, which some of you may be familiar with. It's actually part of the CS Unplugged resources. And so you can just go to csunplugged.org and access those. Um, Tablets of Stone essentially have students role play a network and they get a chance to see all of the um, challenges associated with actually communicating effectively uh, over a network medium. But as far as the actual platform goes, um, we actually go through the process using video explainers and animations about things like, for example, the structure of a packet, which is what we're seeing here on the video, which then leads into a number of questions where you can see students are required to actually um, use a defined format of, in this case, a packet to determine how you're going to route 
information around the network. So here, um, the intention is you, you read in the, the message that arrives, you work out what the source of that particular um, packet is, who the destination is, you switch the channel over to um, send or pass the information on to um, the intended destination, and then you pass that on. And obviously, you then become the source and the destination remains the same. So um, there is a little bit of programming required to sort of get this working, but again, it's scaffolded. We ensure that students build up to this gradually. Um, and the microbit simulator means that even if you don't have microbit devices, students can still write the code, test it, be confident that everything is working. And then once they get to that point, um, if you do have microbits available, they can download the code onto the microbits to, um, to see it all happen in action. So a number of concepts that are actually quite complex are produced and made accessible through analogies. Um, this is an example of how um, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange works and how we can guarantee that we know that the um, person who sent the message was who they claim to be. Um, and there's additional explanation and other supporting um, supporting activities and, and, and examples around this in the challenge itself. Um, and another example of, a, a, an ex of um, a problem where you're actually intercepting code and snooping on communication between three other microbits and how that looks inside the platform. So I've gone through some of the um, supporting materials that exist around the challenges. I've mentioned um, some of those activities that you can see in the lesson plans. Within the Grok Learning Platform, there are also a number of teacher notes and we provide advice and curriculum links throughout the challenges that cover a lot of that. Um, if you're a registered teacher on the platform, then you have access to all of the solutions, whether or not you've completed the problem or not. And that way you can actually provide students with additional support by looking at the problem yourself and being able to sort of identify where they're stuck. Um, but we've also got things like posters for the classroom and a whole stack of other online, uh, offline activities that you can access through the resources section of the ACA website, such as those cards, the cybersecurity cards that we sort of went through at start um, and cipher wheels so that students can work through how a rotation cipher works offline um, in a physical way before they have to sort of work through the, the challenges associated with writing up the code for that. Now you can access the cybersecurity challenges on our website at aca.edu.au on the resources page. And you can see that we have a quick filter on the left hand side for the cybersecurity challenges. They're in blue. Um, and each of the challenges also includes this little curriculum mapping that shows you which of the concepts in the Australian curriculum digital technologies are the focus of that particular activity. So you can see here web application security looks a little bit at how we implement solutions, um, the impact of our actions and those solutions on the broader system and some of the security related issues in digital systems. Um, we've done this not just for our cybersecurity resources, but for all of the student resources on the website. Um, this is just an example specific to the, um, to the challenges. When you click into each of the challenges themselves, this is where you can access the lesson plans and the teacher notes and an expanded version of the curriculum mapping a little bit further down the page as well. So that you can see exactly how each of the activities addresses the different parts of the curriculum. If you just want some um, uh, paraphernalia for your room, then there are these downloadable, really high quality posters that you can print out. They print really nicely right up to A0. Um, one of the things we wanted to do here was actually provide you with really simple, practical examples that you could put up on the wall that remind students about some of these critical security um, issues. So um, everything from sort of the things that you should think about very, very early on when you're establishing your home network to keep it safe, very simple things that you can do, as well as sort of uh, examples of the, you know, what you should and shouldn't share, things to think about, um, the security, the little security um, uh, considerations you can make when you're using your web browser to ensure that everything is, is safe and your data is secure, all of that kind of stuff, you can download those and print them out and put them up around your classroom. So that's it. That's all of the stuff we wanted to get through um, in this afternoon's webinar. Now, 
James and I and probably a couple of the other ACA team are, are happy to sort of sit around and answer your questions. If you've got some questions for a little bit, you can put those in the chat or you can turn on your microphones and ask questions, put your hand up inside the, you know, the participants window and let us know that you've got a question you'd like to ask. Um, and we'll do our best to answer those for anyone who wants to hang around. Um, we, our goal really is just to prepare students to be better uh, online citizens in the future and to be more aware of the, the issues associated with living online. Um, but you can find out more about all of the work we're doing at the ACA at our website and you can reach out to us on the help at aca.edu.au address at any time you like. Um, we've got a team of people monitoring that so that we can make sure that we get back to you um, with the most relevant response. You can hit me up directly on Bruce at ACA um, and you'll find us on socials um, on yep. Twitter and Facebook as well. And just to finish up, this is the, uh, the second or the third, depending on how you're counting, um, of the webinars in the ACA webinar series next week on Monday, four to five. Uh, we've got me and Kenny, who you saw before with the um, ICT card, with the cybersecurity cards, talking about data representation. So looking forward to seeing as many of you as we can next week. Uh, until then, have a great week of teaching and we'll uh, see you again soon.